The following podcast was recorded on Thursday, August 5th, 2021, featuring Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. To hear the podcast in real time, you can sign up for a free trial at arborresearch.com or by emailing Gus Handler directly at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. You can also call Arbor Research and Trading at 1-800-606-1872. Thanks for your time and enjoy the podcast. Welcome everyone to Talking Data. I'm Kristen Radish with Arbor Research and Trading, joined today by Ben Breitholtz of Arbor Data Science. Ben, when we last spoke about a month ago, we talked about supply chain constraints and what it meant for inflation expectations. And today we have quite a few slides prepared that we'd like to run through. And if you could start off, just give us a general idea of where are we at right now with all these leading indicators? Are they pointing towards transitory? Yes, I mean, that is, that is I think uh, it's become more and more unequivocal here as we move forward. It seems like each day we get uh, new news that, you know, something is peaking, be it a price or a survey or even anecdotal evidence regarding the supply chain and the prices to move goods around. And then the overall, the big kind of wild price swings we've seen in some of these idiosyncratic places. And one place we can see that here um, easily is in this chart that we're providing. And in this chart, we've taken essentially a Z-score across six kind of really important measures that everybody's been watching. Um, and what's kind of, again, unanimous here is that these surveys, prices, and so on, which we'll go through in more detail, all peaked in May or June, uh, some in July, but mostly in May and June. So as we started to kind of hypothesize back in April and May that we'd soon get a peak in delivery times, prices paid surveys, flatbed rates for moving stuff around, around the country, uh, that's come to fruition. So now it's just a, it's a race toward how fast do we mean revert? Okay, and let's move to the next slide. This talks about our market volatility. Yes, so here is what's kind of interesting. And um, so even though inflation and inflation expectations have been kind of one of the hottest topics, uh, you know, obviously with your client base, uh, our client base and so on, um, it's pretty surprising that if you look at financial market volatility, in this case, we're looking at the US 30-year bond future, the S&P 500 via the VIX currencies, and then high yield via HYG, the ETF. And if you look at the rolling two-month correlation to tips break evens, uh, we had kind of spiked higher um, in the earlier portion of the year, meaning that as inflation expectations were rising, we were getting higher volatility everywhere. That came um, really, really reversed very quickly to the point now where we have a, a pretty intense negative correlation between inflation expectations, the changes in 10-year tips break evens and market volatility. So that means as growth got better, gets better, and even inflation uh, goes up, uh, volatility actually goes down. Um, so you know, markets have not viewed inflation as a bad thing. Um, and that kind of gets back into what we started this with, which was transitory. If it is transitory, all of these big wild price swings, not everything, I mean, we'll get into that in a second, uh, too. Uh, but if a lot of these supply chain induced price swings and things are kind of abating, um, you know, maybe it's right that markets have investors haven't paid as much attention to inflation. The only issue that I take now is if you look at this chart, this black line is the average correlation to all of these different market volatilities. We're getting to an extreme that's typically not sustainable, which means inflation is likely going to become more front and center. And if you, for listeners to this podcast, uh, Jim and I uh, have talked a lot about how growth has kind of been the driver, um, thanks to the Fed focusing so much on employment, and also the recent slowdown, a little bit of the growth, growth measures as of late, inflation's really been in the back burner, but that is potentially going to change according to this chart. And next, let's move into supply chain constraints. We've talked about how long this will last, and right now we're looking at, I think, and you can confirm this, Ben, next April of 22. Is that still realistic of when we'll get back in working order? Yeah, so if we just use the historical playbook, and oddly enough, the historical playbook has worked really well uh, past using past global recoveries as well as past supply chain-induced issues. Here, what we're doing is measuring supplier delivery times via surveys, ISM, all the regional Fed surveys. And when we did peak, on average, it took somewhere around 10 to 12 months. And like you said, it takes us into April 2022 for supply chain issues to um, abate. Now, 
inflation, headline CPI and PPI from that peak usually take another three to four months uh, to peak out as well. So in this case, if we peaked in May, that means that all of our big supply chain induced bursts should be um, somewhat behind us by the time we get into you know, September, October of this year. Now, there's gonna be some other things that are coming to play, um, like rents and wages, but in terms of the supply chain story, that's something you know we could be moving downhill here um, going forward. And we have one more chart to show um, also in, in regards to the supply chain constraints. If you could just touch again on the 10-year break-evens. Yeah, so if you look back historically at peaks in supply chain um, you know, delivery time or supplier delivery times, it's not that tips break-evens all of a sudden crap out and, you know, and narrow very quickly. They don't. Historically, you actually get into this range-bound scenario. And like we said, it takes three to four months for headline CPI and PPI to peak which would put us you know, into the early fall months. Uh, and if inflation's still somewhat brewing, and there's confusion here about this transition from transitory forces to more sticky like wages and rents, it's very easy to see, to see a scenario where we get range-bound conditions. So the blue line here shows you the median move after all of these peaks in supplier delivery time since 1960, and it's pretty much stuck at zero the whole way through. Nice little tail to the upside, meaning that the risk is more for further upside inflation expectations than downside. Uh, but the odds on bet is to range trade um, inflation expectation is really everything, uh, commodities and also nominal yields and so on. And how about prices paid? Are we beginning to see any relief? What's the forecast? Yeah, so same thing here as the supplier delivery times, prices paid surveys, ISM came out um, not too long ago, a number of days ago, same thing, that peaked just like the Dallas Fed, the Kansas City, the New York Fed, and so on. There's a couple kind of standouts like the Richmond Fed um, that usually beats a little bit of a different drum, um, but all of these ISM you know, prices paid surveys have indeed peaked. I'll make the one caveat, everyone knows I make fun of these because they really are not predictive in the least. They're simply coincidental, um, but it is a good sign that we have all these manufacturers um, and those in the supply chain saying that they believe prices have indeed peaked. Again, it's how fast do we, do we pull back? And the same could be said for container rates, which have been very high. Um, I like the description here of yikes. Um, <laughs> Are we starting to see some relief? Will this begin to come down? So I, I've been of the mindset that these container rates, uh, now this is moving, you know, these are 40 foot boxes uh, that are getting moved, for example, from Shanghai to Genoa to Los Angeles and then back to Shanghai and so on. Um, and, you know, this is where there's been a lot of stress. The Yanti and Port sh uh, shut down, among other issues now with China, I see another, uh, you know, kind of rash of cases. Um, we will potentially keep this moving. Um, but container rates are very elevated. I've said that I think that they are coincidental to a lagging indicator relative to everything else. And um, they'll take longer to peak, and there's still some work kinks to work out. One good positive sign is Shanghai to Los Angeles did peak, um, and that rolled over for the first time in many, many, many weeks, back down to $10,200 per 40-foot box, uh, which is encouraging. But I expect, based on everything we've seen um, from all these other surveys and prices, that there could be something on the horizon here. You know, It's kind of the beginning of the end of these the shock to container rates. It doesn't mean they're going to come down quickly. I really nobody knows. If you asked back in you know June of 2020, would we even get over four thousand, you know, four thousand dollars per forty foot box? Uh, the the professionals and uh, said no way. Um, so I have no idea how quickly. Um, you know, I think I have a pretty good idea with prices paid, delivery times, and so on. With container rates, that's a whole big mess. It could be its own podcast uh, for sure. Um, so that'll take longer. Again, I think it's coincident to lagging indicator. And how about trucking? Have, have we been able to find one truck drivers and how's truck availability? So the, no, we've not found truck drivers, unfortunately, <laughs> and there's not enough trucks. You know, we still, just like everything else with GM shutting down, you know, GM, I think this week or next week is actually shutting down truck production. Uh, which is absolutely wild due to the chip shortage. So that will be a persistent problem. What's helped helped 
is that the market demands actually um, dropped, which is kind of surprising. And But that does fit in with our search activity with the consumer getting less willing to buy and purchase. Um, but what that's resulted in is a, a pretty good drop in the rates per mile of getting stuff shipped on flatbed, you know, on flatbeds around the, around the country. Um, those have, those peaked in some uh, locations like the Midwest around three dollars and fifty cents. That's well above where they were around two dollars uh, to be, you know pre-pandemic. Uh, but those are rolling over. So we kind of have you, you know the hope would be that we get the supply chain and really you know more truck drivers, more trucks on the road. This is something that's been a problem really since 2015. This is not a new issue during due, due to the pandemic. This has really been an issue that's been in play since 2015. Um, it's just been exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, but the big story here is that there's been a lack of, or uh, not lack, but falling demand, not necessarily more trucks, uh, which could be somewhat concerning for the growth prospects of the U.S. And next, let's turn to the um, two apartments in the U.S. We've talked about how it's the tightest market that it's been in a long time. Um, what do you see? What's your forecast? So we, you know, we've been um, hot in the trail of rents. You know, something we started to get kind of more uh, excited, not excited about, but expecting a burst in February of this year when our search activity for anything and all things rent related, uh, from finding one bedroom apartments to vacation rentals went gangbusters. And we started to see some of that percolate in some of the surveys, like we're gonna talk about here in a second, as well as in the list, you know, some of the sites like Zillow and apartment list and so on. So within the US, some of the surveys, for example, this one from the NMHC shows that the tightness in the market, as well as sales are some of the, you know, is, is some of the highest, or I guess in this case, worst first for tightness, most good for, you know, for, for sales that we've seen really historically. Uh, occupancy rates are ex are exceptionally high. Um, you know, we're pushing 99% in many metros. So there's just not that many apartment, there's not enough apartment buildings to really house all of these people that are looking for, you know, looking for new places to live. And again, this is an issue that was kind of um, happening before the pandemic and something that the pandemic really is now highlighting. And unfortunately, it's leading to exceptionally high rents in certain locations. And this gets into the crux of everything we're talking about is, yes, transitory it is, right? Um, yay, you know, that, that camp is going to win, the Fed and so on. But the, there's stickier stuff here, wages and rents, in particular rents with OER being 30% of core inflation that are going to brew and are going to accelerate higher and has already begun. So we're in the midst of this great transition, I think, between the two. And that's why we get this kind of outlook for a range bound scenario for inflation expectations. And where do you see the continued growth? Is it metro areas? I believe we have the next uh, chart to show on that. So yeah, there's there, everyone knows Boise has gone you know gone wild. Boise's you know the people that have lived there have been actively trying to keep the Californians away, um, and because their rents are up thirty to thirty five percent year over year, I mean it's it's exceptional. Uh, but on the on the flip sides, most of the the major metros that we kind of focus on Chicago, San Francisco, uh, San Jose, New York, and so on have rounded the corner. So they're starting to give chase now to some of these medium to smaller size metros and beginning to grow on a year of your basis um, on their own and uh, really it's you know it's it's somewhat of a ubiquitous shift and in this case we're looking at apartment list on the y-axis relative to Zillow on the x-axis the two are kind of calculated very uh, not very but they're different um, apartment list allows you know there's going to be a lot more movement less smooth they do seem to believe that um, you know rental prices can move quickly Zillow is much more sticky and they they take a you know a mean of the 40th to 60th percentile of rents so it's it's really smooth uh, kind of uh, not not exactly but kind of akin to uh, OER and we'll get into that here in a second and we can go ahead and put up our next chart here. So here, here's the big OER. Where are we going to be by year end? We've got quite a forecast of growth. So I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and I think that uh, initially our forecasts were somewhere around three to four percent by year end. You know, as we were in February or March, but things have moved more quickly. Uh, so we're expecting OER year over year to be somewhere around 4.8 to 6.3 percent by December of this year. 
uh, it's December, sorry, end of this year. And that implies that it could add as much as at the upside, one and a half percent of core inflation. Now that's that's on the very upside. So um, that might be a little bit extreme, but uh, what we've done is done the kind of the painstaking work of kind of equalizing here, all of these measures, OER, rent of residences, relative department list and Zillow. So um, we've taken apartment list and slowed it down, done the same thing that Zillow does, use the, the mean of the 40th to 60th percentile. And then essentially, What's interesting is apartment list and Zillow lead uh, OER by approximately six months. So we're, that's how we get these forecasts. So it's not a model. It's just it's you know it since OER essentially uses these panels, you know January to July, February to August, um, and they only record uh, a rent by a unit or per unit twice a year. I think they cover 30,000 plus of them. Um, and then they also have, you know, it's an average of all of that. And then it's a six month, essentially growth rate, average growth rate um, placed on top of it. So it's really slow moving. Um, and that's why I think we get the six month lag that we're able to look at, but it gives us a good idea, a pretty good idea of where OER should be. Um, and it looks like we're, we're right to take out the highs that we saw, you know, back in June of 2019, around three and a half percent and, uh, you know, maybe get as high as, you know, four to six percent. And how about rent search activity? So this is what got us kind of into the belief that OER would really get moving. So here it shows on a month to month basis, the search activity, in this case, we kind of categorized a bunch of search topics within the US, you know, just general apartments, one bedrooms, and then those talking and looking and discussing rent prices and renting in general. Um, and everything except for the one bedroom for, uh, is still remaining positive, meaning those, that search activity is growing. Um, in this case, we're showing it Z-score uh, and Z-score is stacked. Um, but beginning in January or February of this year, it, it made a quick push. It really, you know, uh, crescendoed um, in May and into June is somewhat pulled back, which is not too surprising given some of the slowing search activity we see for consumer goods and services, but it still remains robust. And the next chart shows, I believe, the opposite, which is, you know, what is what are search topics that could be bad for the rental market? In this case, individuals filing for bankruptcy are at least interested in that process, charge us. And the big one here is eviction and moratorium. So everything except for more the eviction moratorium has dropped, meaning that, you know, Basically, the, the end consumers and would-be renters balance sheet is in order. The, you know, we have a high degree of savings. Even if the flow has slowed down, the stock is, you know, is, is high. Uh, but the, the lingering concern here is the moratorium. There's a lot of debate going on right now. It sounds like it's going to be pushed out into early October. We'll see if that sticks. And uh, you know that cliff of kind of causing asking and collected rents to collapse uh, may not happen as soon as we thought. But nonetheless, you know, some form or some end to this moratorium is is likely in the months to come. Um, e even though you know Biden had said that would be the last of it uh, when they had extended it to Jan 31, but I understand they keep pushing it forward, and that's not anything to do with you know Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've had these continued um, high prices for quite a while now. How is it impacting consumers' desire to spend? So right, so you know housing. Housing is exceptionally expensive. You know, existing home sales is averaging uh, their average home is over three hundred fifty thousand. Rents rising, like we said, uh, in places in Boise, up over thirty to thirty-five percent year over year. And then if you go into your local, you know, Best Buy or Apt, yeah, what you'll see is you know get sticker shock over the appliances you need to purchase. So uh, everyone's caught onto this by now. I think we were one of the earlier ones to really bring this up. But the the spread between uh, you know favorable and unfavorable buying conditions related the price for large household durables, houses, and vehicles, it reached the worst, meaning it's the worst buying conditions really in history looking back to the late 1970s. So that has begun to crimp growth. And what's interesting about this bout is that it's kind of creating a different type of um, I think inflation and worry. So traditionally inflation would mean that okay, um, you know, I, I see these prices going up for a wash machine. Um, should I wait or should I buy now? Because I think it's going to be persistent. Um, uh, maybe, you, you know, if you do think it's going to be persistent, you're going to go out and buy it and you'll, you know, consumers will fuel more and more and more inflation that becomes a vicious cycle. And that's what Powell was talking about, um, you know, during um, one of his last uh, discussions with the public. 
and you know they need pers to see pers uh, was during the FOMC meeting um, need to see persistent inflation something that's permanent and this time around it seems like consumers are very apprehensive and maybe they'll wait and actually temper demand which will be somewhat of its a throttle on its own on inflation and so we'll see if that's something that's persistent or not seems like it won't be which again fits into this whole transitory um, story that seems to be playing out just like they thought. We've got a few more slides we'll just go through here quickly um, in regards to that same point with consumers and inflation. So yeah, so in this case here, what we're looking at is the University of Michigan consumer survey again. And what you'll see is the you know percentage of respondents by age group that are reporting they believe five plus percent headline inflation will occur over the next year. Um, you know, previously that seemed like a wild, crazy outsized number. Uh, this day and age, after the pandemic, not so much, but we have elevated numbers across all age groups. Even the younger cohort, 18 to 34, which were lagging the rest, have finally caught up. But do remember, this is a phenomenon that is pretty normal um, after a recession. Look back to 1991, look back to uh, you know when we were in the financial crisis and coming out of it, uh, we had similar kind of bouts of, of inflation. Um, something happened similar in 2011 when you know a lot of commodity prices were, were very elevated. So we'll see how sticky this is, how long this can last. You have you have plenty like Clarida who are focusing heavily on these surveys to dictate policy. So they will be watching these, how, how long these stay at elevated levels. Essentially, consumers thinking there'll be a right side tail um, will be important. But I think these will, will likely come back down as these transitory forces abate. I'll we'll take a look at our next chart here. And this just also illustrates the point. Um, if our consumers int intentions to be a little bit lower as we end summer. Yes, so maybe it's prices, you know, elevated prices. Maybe it's the rolling off of stimulus. We have the last stimulus checks, you know, in March that has kind of, um, you know, started to roll off. We also have indications that the savings that consumers have built up are starting to get spent, uh, maybe to a minor degree, uh, which means that maybe spending power won't be as great. But the search activity for both staying in, which in this case, in this chart that we show here is in orange and going out goods and services, which are in blue. Um, all of those have kind of have receded since, you know, really mid to late March, which is after we had gotten that last round of stimulus checks. Fortunately, they've begun to rebound since uh, early June. So it's not that we're in a dire situation at all, just we're kind of running near average, um, nothing too exciting, but that's not, not necessarily rip roaring growth that would say that consumers are buying, um, you know, ahead of these price increases and in fueling inflation. It's not really part of that storyline, which again, fits back into transitory. And the last two items that we'll touch on today are, we wanna to touch on housing and also job searches. So housing, you'd mentioned higher prices that we're experiencing right now. And how does that translate into the search activity, what people are looking for? Yes, we, so as soon as uh, you know, we started printing these 350,000 plus average existing home prices, all of a sudden you know, we saw things skid. So this chart here shows really the entire home buying process and the search activity that relates to it. Everything from finding a realtor all the way out to the closing costs and title, title costs and so on. Um, and everything and anything in that space is essentially kind of cratered into early June, which fit a lot with the you know existing home sales, new home sales, and the like all starting to struggle. Um, just like the other search activity, we've begun to see somewhat of a you know a modest or moderate rebound in that in these searches, especially even those that are starting to think about buying things like pre-approvals, finding real estate agents, and so on. That's begun to improve, which is good because that's the early signs of, of purchase. Purchases. Um, but I think a lot of it too might come down to, um, you know, affordability, unfortunately. And uh, I think, you know, consumers based on this chart and based on a lot of the work we look at are apprehensive about buying right now homes. And that's maybe why renting has become so, um, you know, in demand. And we've seen those rental prices increase as well. So this will be worth watching. The most interesting thing is housing data is all sudden front and center. Um, it is incredibly negatively correlated to market volatilities at the moment, the most on record. So uh, housing data, unfortunately, is going to be a must watch and maybe should be at the top of everybody's list. It doesn't matter what you're trading or what you're investing in. And what can you tell us about job searches? When we talked about a month ago, it was very rosy. And has that changed? Has it curtailed? 
So that's, you know, we will have a recording this on Thursday ahead of non-farm payrolls, and that data has unfortunately slowed. So again, nothing that is overtly concerning, but all stages of the job seeking and recruiting process for the most part have skid in recent weeks. And that places, I can't remember the exact number, but using all of that search activity, we essentially forecast non-farm payrolls to be somewhere around 650,000 with the potential to be as low as I think just above 200,000 uh, if we do see it, indeed see a miss. So the job market has slowed and it's, it's oddly slowed the most in these states that have ended um, enhanced unemployment benefits. And that's not necessarily because of that. Some of these states were already in um, you know, not as good a position as many of the others. Um, but the, the housing, not sorry, housing, the employment market here or employment in general is going to be so critical for the Federal Reserve since that's kind of their hyper focus. If that slows down, we're going to have an interesting scenario where um, they'll have to potentially put, you know, push out the taper. And it feels like the Federal Reserve is trying, the Federal Reserve as a whole, um, you know, it, they're trying to get a consensus here on when to announce taper and it'll be at Jackson Hole um, later this month, or it could be in you know, September, October, or so on. Um, seems like they're trying to form that consensus. And the more that that remains weak, um, uh, and really, you know, the more that this transitory inflation is what happens, the more they could push out the taper and that will have ramifications pretty much everywhere and anywhere. Um, so there's a lot going on here, a lot of movie parts that we all need to watch. Well, thank you, Ben, for all your thoughts today and walking us through the charts. We really appreciate it. Thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, Arbor Research and Trading is an institutional research and brokerage firm. Our two most prominent offerings are Bianco Research and Arbor Data Science. For any questions or further information, please contact Gus Handler at gus.handler at arborresearch.com. Have a great day.